Imagine looking at the solar system as if you were observing a cosmic clock. Everything seems to spin on the same plane, with the hands pointing in the same direction. Since childhood, we've learned to picture the sun at the center and around it, concentric rings representing the planet's orbits. But why is this plate so organized? Is it just coincidence? Or is there a deeper process, repeated across the universe, that turns chaos into order? Today, we'll follow that question back to its source. Billions of years ago, when the solar system was still just dust, gas, and possibilities. The first clue is the regularity we see not only in the planets, but also in the regular moons of the gas giants. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have whole families of satellites that orbit around their planet's equators, mostly in the same direction those worlds spin. The spectacle is even clearer at Saturn. Its rings, a thin, vast, elegant disk, lie exactly on the same plane where its regular moons orbit. It's a recurring pattern. The question is how nature makes this happen. To figure it out, we need to go back to the beginning, when our solar system was a fragment of a great nebula, a huge cloud of gas and dust in an H2 region, a stellar nursery lit by radiation from nearby stars. In that state, the particles were, on average, in balance. Gravity tried to pull them together, while the gas's internal pressure, the thermal push, resisted collapse, until something external destabilized the setup, a supernova shock wave, the passage of an ionization front, or another energetic event that locally compressed the cloud. That nudge was enough to break the balance and start the collapse. As the cloud began to fall in on itself, particles started colliding and clumping. Grain meets grain becomes a pebble. Pebble meets pebble becomes a larger body. As mass grows, gravity gets stronger, pulling in even more material. The center of this maelstrom heats up due to impacts and compression. A protostar is born, a baby star that hasn't yet started nuclear fusion in its core, but already dominates its surroundings with gravity. At first, material plunges in from every direction. It's a turbulent, noisy, violent environment. Collisions between particles are constant, and that has a crucial effect. They trim the random components of motion especially those trajectories that cross in opposite directions. In simple terms, parts of the angular momentum, the tendency of a body to keep rotating in the same direction, cancel out when particles spinning in different directions collide and exchange energy and momentum. However, the original cloud wasn't perfectly neutral. It already had a small total angular momentum, a slight preferred rotation, however tiny. After all the collisions, what remains is precisely that preferred direction. An intuitive way to picture the process is to think of experiments with a stretched elastic sheet, often lycra, representing space warped by a mass at the center. If you launch small balls in different directions, many collide and lose their sideways push. The ones that remain tend to circle in the same direction simply because the opposing motions were damped out by interactions. Space has no fabric friction, of course, and everything happens in three dimensions, not two, but the metaphor helps. Repeated encounters and exchanges reduce the mess and preserve a resulting rotation. The practical outcome of this fine combing is the rise of a disk, the protoplanetary disk. It's thin because collisions dissipate the motions that would pull particles out of the plane, and it spins as a whole in the direction left over from the vector sum of all the initial motions. While gas and dust feed the protostar, the geometry of impacts makes the young star itself inherit that spin. It begins rotating aligned with the disk around it. Over time, the rate of infalling material drops and more mass remains in orbit, circulating in the disk along increasingly stable paths. Inside this disk, what we described happens again, now on a planetary scale. Grains stick together, forming pebbles, rocks, then planetesimals, and eventually protoplanets. If a region piles up too much mass, it can even produce another star, and you end up with a binary, or multiple system, instead of a planetary system. But in scenarios like ours, those clumps become planets. And around massive planets, the sequence repeats in miniature. A circumplanetary disk appears, aligned with the planet's spin and orbital plane. And from it, regular moons are born. The alignment we see today, planets orbiting in a common plane, spinning mostly in coherent directions, with regular satellites on the equatorial plane, is an elegant scar of the formation process. We have observational evidence of this behavior in real time, right here in our cosmic backyard. Saturn is the perfect laboratory. During the Cassini mission, 
instruments detected moonlets, small clumps of material within the rings, formed by local gravitational interactions and gentle collisions that favor cohesion. Some of these seed moons broke apart soon after, just as surely happened countless times in the early solar system. But others persisted for long periods. The shepherd moons, in turn, sweep paths and sculpt gaps in the rings, a high-definition snapshot of how disks organize and shape themselves through their own dynamics. Of course, the solar system's orbital plane isn't a perfect sheet of paper. Each planet has a small tilt relative to the average plane, the ecliptic, a few degrees up or down. That doesn't contradict the picture. The overall signature is alignment, with small variations inherited from each orbit's local history, encounters, resonances, and subtle nudges over billions of years. Another key ingredient in the order we see today was the progressive cleanup of chaos. Early on, asteroids, comets, and planetesimals were abundant, constantly swapping routes and colliding with everything. The surfaces of many worlds preserve the record of that era. Crater dating indicates heavy bombardment at the beginning, followed by a sharp drop in impact rates as material was absorbed by planets and moons, and whatever remained settled into more stable orbital niches. In other words, the more things found their place, the fewer collisions occurred. This kind of behavior, ordered structures emerging from local, seemingly random interactions, is a classic example of self-organization. We see it in many natural contexts. Think about hurricane formation. Turbulent motions in a warm, humid atmosphere under planetary rotation can organize into a stable vortex with symmetry and layers. In space, self-organization shows up in protoplanetary disks, moon systems, planetary rings, and even in the grand architectures of spiral galaxies, where the combined behavior of billions of stars, gas, and dark matter regains coherent patterns because of gravity and dynamical interactions. It's worth noting that self-organization also marks other key moments in cosmic history. The very formation of stars and planets is an emergent process, and more broadly, the evolution of structure in the universe after the Big Bang, from tiny density fluctuations to filaments, clusters, and galaxies, is a spectacular case of order arising from the initial noise. The recurring message is the same. Given the rules and enough time, the universe has a way of turning turbulence into symmetry. And it's not just a philosophical deduction. Today we can observe disks around young stars at different stages, some packed with gas and dust, others with gaps, rings, and asymmetries that reveal planets in the making. We've also detected planetary systems where giants orbit their stars on shared planes, reinforcing that our solar system's recipe isn't a local oddity but a common chapter in the story of star formation. In certain cases, of course, there are tilts, migrations, and chaotic events giant impacts, gravitational encounters, that twist or rewrite details, the universe loves exceptions. But the baseline pattern repeats. An initial disk, inherited rotation, and objects that end up sharing a plane. Summing up the journey, no, it isn't a coincidence that planets orbit the Sun almost on the same plane and in the same direction. It's a direct consequence of disk formation physics collisions and interactions during the collapse of a cloud with a small preferred angular momentum, trimmed, disordered motions, and preserved one direction, sculpting a thin, spinning disk. From that disk came the sun's rotation, the planet's orbits, circumplanetary disks, and regular moons. Saturn, with its rings and shepherd moons, still performs the miniature version of this choreography today. The craters scattered across airless moons and worlds tell the story of the early bombardment followed by relative calm once the house finally got tidier. And observations of exoplanets and disks around other stars show that the same dance plays out on many stages across the cosmos. In the end, there's something poetic about watching the universe work like this. From primordial noise to the well-aligned vinyl record of the solar system, an invisible needle, gravity, with help from time and collisions, cuts a common groove where everything finds the right track to play order out of chaos. That's why our plate spins so neatly aligned. If this journey through the birth of orbits pulled you in, share the video and subscribe to the channel. Leave a like to help it reach more people. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.